Lecture 6, Trade and Evangelization, 1400s to the 1700s. Extent of trading between East Asia and European countries took place during the so-called Age of Discovery of the late 15th century. This age was in part sparked by the fall of Constantinople in 1453 to the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Prior to its fall, Constantinople was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and served as a doorway through which traders entered in in order to access the silk routes to Asia. Upon gaining control over this key port city, the Ottoman M Muslims began charging Europeans prohibitively high prices to cross over Ottoman-controlled lands. This incentivized Europeans to seek out cheaper trade routes to Asia. Some of the most important European discoverers of alternative trade, alternative trade routes to East Asia include Henry the Navigator, King John II of Portugal, Bartol Bartolomeo Diaz, Vasco da Gama, Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Magellan, and John Cabot. They all had the same goal of finding a new trade route to Asia. As will be evident, the Portuguese, who depended more on trade than other European countries, were the first to discover new trading routes and establish colonies in the process. The Spanish, the British, and Dutch followed soon after. Beginning with the Jesuits, Catholic missionaries traveled the new trading routes to Asia. The two most prominent of the early Jesuit missionaries to Asia were St. Francis Xavier and Matteo Ricci. Debate over what constituted acceptable means for evangelizing the Asian people divided missionaries. In the debate, Jesuits were more open than Dominicans and Franciscans in accepting certain features of Asian worldviews. Asian countries also differed among one another over how to relate to European merchants, colonizers, and missionaries. China, Japan, and Korea all attempted to control the influence of foreigners on their lands by restricting trade to specific regions and by controlling or prohibiting missionary activity. European Explorers in Search for the Orient Inspired by reading Marco Polo's travels to Asia, the Portuguese prince Henry the Navigator, lived from 1394 to 1460, financed Atlantic Ocean expeditions around Africa with the hope of teaching Asia. Below in your transcript I provide routes that he sponsored. Shortly after Prince Henry's death, the King of Portugal, John II, also sponsored explorers with the same hope of discovering alternative trading routes to Asia. Bartolomeu, Bartolomeu Dias was a particularly famous explorer who was backed by King John II. In 1488, Dias successfully sailed around the southern tip of Africa and landed at South Africa's Mosul Bay. Dias' exploration was tragically cut short, however, when he and his ship were lost at sea in 1500. Dias' dream to reach Asia was fulfilled by another Portuguese explorer, Vasco da Gama. In 1498, Vasco da Gama became the first European to navigate by sea to India. The route he discovered connected Europe and Asia with the non-land-based route. Unlike the previously mentioned Portuguese explorers, Christopher Columbus, John Cabot, and Ferdinand Magellan all attempted to discover a trade route to Asia by sailing west rather than east. Only Magellan was successful. Under the patronage of the Spanish Queen Isabella I and Ferdinand II, Columbus sailed westward in order to reach Asia, but encountered a huge landmass that prevented him from going further. And this huge landmass, of course, was America. The Italian explorer John Cabot, also known as Juan Chaboto, 1450-1499, attempted to find a northwest passage through America to Asia. In so doing, he became the first European since the Vikings to set foot on mainland North America. Other notable explorers who shared the goal of Cabot included Henry Hudson, Jacques Cartier, René Robert Cavalier, and Sir de la Salle. Due to the massive size of America, none of them succeeded. Sponsored by King Charles I of Spain, the Portuguese, Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan attempted to reach Asia by sailing southwest around South America. En route, he died in a battle in the Philippines. Continuing on without him, his expedition finally reached Southeast Asia as, the, as 
the map in your transcript both indicates. Trade and colonization. The Portuguese and the Spanish were the first to establish trading posts, and in the case of Spain, a colony in East Asia. When the world balance of power shifted in favor of England and her allies, the English and the Dutch people of the Netherlands began establishing colonies in Asia. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 is representative of this change in world power. In the previous lecture, the Spanish conquest of the Philippines was touched upon. This was the only region in East Asia that the Spanish were able to include in their empire. In contrast with Spain, Portugal was able to colonize many regions of Asia, including locations in Malaysia and China. After the Portuguese defeated the Chinas in Malacca, Malaysia in 1511, Portuguese merchants traveled to China and established trade with the Chinese. Due to the reputation of the Portuguese for being impolite and not respectful of Chinese customs, the Ming Dynasty in 1521 restricted the Portuguese from entering China. The Portuguese king responded in 1523 by trying to establish a treaty. In the process, the Portuguese commissioned by their king engaged in a military skirmish with the Chinese. In 1557, Chinese officials avoided further confrontation with the Portuguese by allowing them to found a trading post in land near the Pearl River and close to the South China Sea. The Portuguese named the land Macau. Macau was overseen by the Portuguese until 1999, when the sovereignty of Macau was officially translated from Portugal to China. In the 1600s, the Dutch defeated the Portuguese presence in Southeast Asia. In so doing, the Dutch became the dominant European power in Southeast Asia. As a consequence, regions of Malaysia and Indonesia fell under Dutch rule. In establishing their Asian colonies, the Dutch, unlike the Portuguese and Spanish, did not prioritize evangelizing the people with Christianity. One Dutch company, particularly known for its great wealth and its monopolization of Southeast Asian trade, was the Dutch East India Company. The company was known for ruthlessly killing native people in order to quell unrest. During the 1600s as well, the French successfully established themselves in Vietnam. French Catholic missionaries westernized Vietnam by inventing and introducing a Vietnamese alphabet based on the Roman alphabet. The Vietnamese had been relying upon the Chinese character system of writing. In the 1800s, which will be presented in the next lecture, the British displaced the Dutch as the dominant power in Asia. Catholic missionaries. Many Catholic missionaries spoke out and against and resisted the Europeans' brutal treatment of the Asian people. The Spanish Jesuit Catholic missionary, St. Francis of Xavier, lived from 1506 to 1552, criticized the Portuguese presence in, at Indonesia's Maluku Islands by asserting that they had, quote, an amazing capacity for inventing, inventing new tenses and participles for the verb to steal. After evangelizing people in India, in 1545, Francis Xavier landed in the Malaysian city of Malacca. He stayed in this region of Southeast Asia for 18 months while preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to the people of Malaysia and of Indonesia. At the end of 18 months, he returned to India. While there, he was inspired to travel to Japan. In 1549, he sailed to Japan. He learned that in order to effectively evangelize the Japanese, he needed to shed his poorly dressed appearance, which when he was in India appealed to the Indian sense of a holy poor man. The Japanese, however, did not share this Indian connection of poverty with holiness. When in Japan, Francis Xavier presented himself well dressed before the Japanese rule of, ruler of Kyoto. He also introduced himself as a representative of the King of Portugal. Impressed by Francis Xavier, the ruler offered him protection and housing in a Buddhist monastery. With the backing of the Kyoto ruler, Francis Xavier baptized around 2,000 Japanese. Once a core group was formed whom he could rely upon, Francis Xavier returned to India and stayed there for about four months before setting sail once again eastward. His final goal was to evangelize China. He did not obtain this goal but instead became ill and died in Shangchuan, an island near the coast of China. 
The Italian Jesuit Mario Ricci, lived from 1552 to 1610, was one of the first Jesuits to evangelize China. He was born in the same year that Francis Xavier died. Like, like Francis Xavier, Ricci spent a number of years in India before setting sail to the Portuguese-administered Chinese territory of Macau. There he began mastering the Chinese language and learning about the Chinese culture. When the news of Ricci's knowledge of astronomy and skill in map-making reached the Chinese emperor, Ricci was invited to see the emperor in China's forbidden city. One way Ricci attempted to draw the Chinese to the Catholic faith was by adopting non-European ways and intellectual ideas that he thought were compatible with the Catholic faith. Other Jesuits also shared in this manner of evangelization. As mentioned previously, they met resistance from Dominican and Franciscan missionaries who complained to Rome. Issues of concern included the use of Confucian concepts when teaching Christianity and the acceptance by some Jesuits of the Chinese tradition of honoring the dead. In 1645, Pope Innocent X responded to these concerns by decreeing that the Chinese rites promoted by the Jesuits were forbidden. In 1721, the Chinese emperor responded to Rome's assertion that the Chinese practice of ancestor veneration rites are not compatible with the Catholic faith by forbidding Christians from evangelizing in, in China. Currently, Rome is revisiting Ritchie's missionary work in China that was appreciated by the Chinese more than by some influential Catholics of Ricci's time. In 1984, Ricci was declared a servant of God. In 2010, the cause of beatification of Ricci was formally opened. An historical commission has been gathering together documents of Ricci in order to critically analyze them. In 2013, the first stage for the beatification of Ricci was completed. Both Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis have positively appraised Ricci's methods of evangelization. According to Benedict XVI, speaking on the fourth centenary of Ricci's death, he said this, Father Ricci's unique cause of felicitous synthesis between the proclamation of the gospel and the dialogue with the culture of the people to whom he brought it. He is an example of balance between doctrinal clarity and prudent pastoral action. Not only his profound knowledge of the language, but also his assumption of the lifestyle and customs of the cultured Chinese classes. The result of study and its patient, far-sighted implementation ensure that Father Ricci was accepted by the Chinese with respect and esteem, no longer as a foreigner, but as the master of the Great West. In continuity with the, this appreciation of Ricci, Pope Francis stated in November 2013, We must always ask forgiveness and look with shame upon apostolic failures brought about by a lack of courage. I'm thinking, for example, of the pioneering intuitions of Mario Ricci, which at time at the time, were abandoned. A few other heroic people who brought the Catholic faith to East Asia include Father Alessandro Valignano, Father Alexandre de Rhodes, and Yi Sung Hun. Building upon the missionary work of St. Francis Xavier, the Italian Jesuit Father Alessandro Valignano lived from 1539 to 1606, evangelized people of India, Japan, and China. During the latter part of the 16th century, Valignano was the leading Jesuit missionary of Asia. As a Jesuit's canonical visitor of the Asian missionaries, Valignano helped to give direction to missions in India, China, and Japan. He did this in a diplomatic manner. This style of his is evident in his establishment of the first Japanese embassy to Europe. On June 4, 1587, at the Goa Jesuit College, the ambassador Hara Martinho praised Valignano in the following manner, and I quote, Blessed are the eyes that see such things, and blessed are we who have seen them. But more blessed are you, Alexander, great in virtue, for you were the principal cause of our participation in so much good. O Alexander, greater far than Alexander the Great, you have conquered and pacified almost all India with the arms of Christ. There remains now only the world of Japan, no easy conquest to any other than Alexander. 
Storm that country with the arms of God. Conquer it with good works. Wrest our fatherland from the enemy most cruel and bring it to true freedom. The Japanese call out to you. They long for you. The winds are favorable. The seas calm. The doors are open wide. End of quote. In 1614, the missionary work that Valignano had overseen in Japan was greatly diminished when Jesuits were ordered to leave Japan. They were accused of disrupting Japan's Confucian social order. Some Jesuits responded by going to Vietnam in order to evangelize there. The leading Jesuit missionary to Vietnam from this time was the French Jesuit Father Alexander de Rhodes. From 1627 to 1630, Alexander brought over 6,700 Vietnamese into the Catholic faith. A number of means he used to evangelize included writing a catechism for the Vietnamese and writing a Vietnamese dictionary complete with a Romanized alphabet. This is the alphabet the Vietnamese currently use. We will end with Yi Sung Hun, a missionary in Asia who is neither Jesuit nor European. Yi Sung Hun was the first Korean convert to Catholicism. He lived from 1756 to 1801. He received baptism in 1784 from a French priest and former Jesuit living in Beijing, China. The reason why Yi was in Beijing was because for a number of years, he and other Korean scholars had been studying Chinese writings on the Jesuits in Beijing. Their study motivated them to go to Beijing in 1748 in 1784 in order to talk with the Jesuit priests. While there, E asked to be baptized. After being taught basic catechism, Father Jean-Joseph de Gramont baptized E with the Christian name of Peter, or Pierre. Before returning to his homeland of Korea, E obtained crosses and other items to give to his friends. Back in Korea, he, along with Yi Pek, formed a small Catholic community. In his zeal, he baptized a number of Koreans into the Catholic faith. In 1786, he even attempted to celebrate the Eucharist, the Mass, which since he was not ordained to the priesthood was invalid, but he did not know this. By 1789, the Korean Catholic community had grown to about a thousand members. All of, the, all of this occurred without priests and even without the benefit of a Bible. When governmental officials heard about Yi's Christian community, they attempted to eliminate what they perceived was a threat to their national security and unity. Between 1784 and 1794, over 400 Korean Christians were publicly martyred. News of the plight of the Korean Christians reached the Bishop of Beijing, Monsignor de Gauvet. He responded by sending a Chinese priest, James Chu Wenmo, to properly catechize the Korean Christians. In 1801, Father James Chu Wenmo was also martyred, but after he had for five years properly instructed Korean Christians in the Catholic faith. At the time of his martyrdom, the Catholic Church in Korea had grown to 10,000 members. God bless.